Welcome everyone to Modern Horror's 2018 Tour Kickoff, and we're not the only ones who are back. Victor Crowley lives. Don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. Adam Green made the first Hatchet movie to fill what he thought of as a void in early 2000s horror movies of slasher flicks that were both bloody and fun. And by all accounts, he was very successful. Hatchet did fairly well for an independent film, almost immediately developing a cult following, and Green spent the next few years diversifying his portfolio, you know, staying away from the old school slashers and adding his first producer credit. But with the Hatchet army growing, he just couldn't stay away from the swamp, so he got the band back together to film Hatchet 2, barely three years later. Truth be told, I'm not sure what else I can add to this introduction. By all indications, this is a sequel that was made for the the purest and most wholesome reasons. The cast and the crew had a great time making the original, and as the fan base grew, people wanted another one. So getting back together and making another one was something that would make everyone happy. <laughs> Luckily, the movie itself doesn't have much preamble either. Picking up right after the original film's ending, they take a few seconds to throw Kane into some nicer makeup and tag in veteran scream queen Danielle Harris as the new Mary Beth. She escapes Crowley by gouging his eyes out, but then her swimming away is pretty haphazard. A bit this way, look behind, over there, look there. We learned last time that Victor's got a slight respawn cooldown he's got to contend with, so it would seem like adding some distance would be priority number one for her. Also, despite her frantic scanning of the swamp, she completely misses seeing Jack Cracker, who rescues her from the water. His decor is a nice mix of Swamp House Chic and Doomsday Prepper, and they talk about how lucky Mary Beth was to make it out of the swamp live. I think it's nice and warm. What, what's your name? Mary Beth Dunstan. Do you or a loved one suffer from any of the following? Persistent traumatic music use, acute spiky hairitis, feeling of being meant for more than this, sudden actor replacement syndrome, you or they may be a protagonist. You may be entitled to compensation and lengthy franchise contracts. Please get tested today. Holy Christ, you're Samson's kid. Jack flips his shit because her father has some sort of connection to Crowley and forces her back out into the swamp at gunpoint. Not even a to-go cup. How rude. It's nice and warm. I didn't know who she was. It don't count. And with that crisis handily averted, he looks through a pile of crap that he scavenged from last night's victims, including some fresh TNA from earlier in Shapiro's porn collecting adventure. Score. Dude, I'm 14! Uh, oh, okay, we're done. And so is Jack. Crowley breaks in and strangles him to death with his own intestines. So let's cut to the heavy metal. After what must have been several hours of hiking, Mary Beth makes it back to New Orleans on, I don't know, overweight and regretful Wednesday, which lends itself to far fewer boobs than Fat Tuesday, and at least that gives me a lot less to censor. She gets to Reverend Zombie's door, and he's still fabulous. Does he put that eye makeup on every day, or has he just left it on since yesterday without messing it up? Either way, that's a lot of effort for somebody who keeps saying he's out of business. Yeah, you know, maybe if he didn't have such a crippling makeup addiction, he'd have an easier time keeping his doors open. On her way into the shop, we see an advertisement for Jack Chop, which is an Adam Green Halloween infomercial parody. It's on YouTube, and it's very funny. You should watch it. And on TV is a news report interviewing the survivor of Frozen, Green's last movie. Which is to say that, yeah, the last 30 seconds created a shared universe of Adam Green projects. An Adam green -iverse. What do you need from me? Everybody's dead. She says that like he knows who she's talking about. Were you on that tour? Okay, apparently he does know about the tour. That was one of my boats. Ah, it's because he's been running the tours out of the back of another shop for plausible deniability. Times are tough and money is money. You sound just like my daddy. Who's your father? Samson Dunstan. You know, considering that the last person she mentioned her father to pulled a gun on her, she's very calm about making another name drop. Well, how is old Samson doing? He's dead. Although Zombie has quite the opposite reaction as Jack, and actually seems very affected by news of Samson's demise. Please. What do you know? He starts narrating, so now it's time for Victor Crowley Origins. Here's the abridged version. Once upon a time, Thomas Crowley and his wife Cheyenne lived alone in the swamp. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna lie, I was half expecting the wife to be played by Kane Hodder too. Tragically, she contracted some form of stomach cancer, and for comfort, Thomas began an affair with her nurse, Lena. Thomas and Lena carrying on in secret. Wait, wait, I am sorry. How fucking secret can this be? They're ten feet away. Before the day came when Cheyenne 
finally found peace from his suffering. Mrs. Crowley's body isn't even cold yet, and he starts making out with the nurse, so in the face of that level of disrespect, she comes back from the dead to throw down a voodoo curse. Victor Crowley was born ridden with grotesque tumors, disease, living monster. You know, as you do. Sorry, we've seen this part already. Some quick flashes of Victor Crowley's greatest hits serve to get in some more cameos and keep the gore coming. Now most of these guys are behind the scenes folks from other Adam Green projects or just friends, but standouts include Joe Lynch, the director of Knights of Badassdom, which is funny and you should also go watch, and Sean Ashmore in another Frozen cast cameo. And finally, we connect Mary Beth to all this backstory because the kid in the pig mask the night Crowley died was her father. She threatens to let the cops in on Zombie's back alley tour scheme, so he agrees to help her get back into the swamp and collect her family's corpses and, you know, maybe just a little bit of vengeance. He's gonna call some hunters to form a brute squad and very conspicuously suggest that she bring someone like her uncle. Cough, cough, nudge, nudge, call Bob. Or else he's calling the whole thing off. So if I bring my uncle back, then you will take us. That's what I said. Justin! <laughs> hey! Perry Shen returns to the series playing the twin brother of his character from the last movie, this time with really roughly 16% more beard. We're going on a little expedition. And with that button on the scene, we can cut to a minor shower tease from Mary Beth before introducing Uncle Bob, played by legendary writer-director Tom Holland. <laughs> you know, oddly, he's not too keen on going literal ghost hunting in the murder swamp and makes Mary Beth promise not to go off with Reverend Zombie. So cue slightly comic smash cut to Mary Beth sitting in Reverend Zombie's voodoo shop as more horror luminaries wander in. Oh, monsieur. Welcome to the house of voodoo. Perry Shen is greeting them all with another ludicrously fake accent until Ari Mihailov appears as Trent and calls him on. Drop the phony accent, asshole. Chips ahoy. Next up is AJ Bowen as Leighton. And then some minor asides to introduce our comic relief character, Vernon, and Leighton's ex, Avery, before some more drive-by cameos. Steve Barton, Marcus Dunstan, Lloyd Kaufman, and Rick McCallum. Zombie arrives to much fanfare and some in-universe scenery chewing. Now he tries to keep grandstanding through Vernon's constant interruptions and eventually gets the point across. Victor Crowley. At which point almost everybody decides that they don't want to hunt the fabled murder ninja and vacates the premises. Trent tries to leave with the crowd, but Zombie basically throws money at him until he decides to stick around. $1,000 cash, $500. Right now, up for 501 Uncle Bob is positively radiant! I mean, he's radiating pure seething anger, but he is... Radiant, nonetheless. Tom Holland can pull off some epic bitch face. With Uncle Bob in the fold, we round out the cannon fodder with two more hunters, Chad and Cletus. Who's Victor Crowley? You mean like a Jason Voorhees or I lived in this town called Glen Echo. Wait, I'm sorry, where's Chad from? Glen Echo. Okay, we need to unpack this. Glen Echo, Maryland is the setting of meta horror slasher behind the mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. So Chad connects that movie to this shared universe. But beyond that, in Behind the Mask, the original famous slashers, you know, Freddy, Michael, Jason, are all real. So the Greeniverse is a world where the slasher flicks that inspired him actually happened. His creation, Victor Crowley, is a movie world contemporary of those famous killers. In sharp contrast to the happy-go-lucky wagon train music from the first movie's traveling sequence, the hunters drive boats into the swamp to a suitably intense orchestral theme. While Chad and Cletus bond over their stereotypically jock and hick names, over in the main boat, Vernon is singing this. Biscuits and chicken and gravy for the biscuit is me. Is anyone else hungry? I mean, it's a terrible jingle, but biscuits sell themselves. Zombie tells Mary Beth that since she described hurting Crowley, that maybe the trick to killing the ghost is to hurt him a lot. With many, many bullets. Kind of undercutting his earlier point about Crowley being a repeater who just comes back every night. 
Yeah, I don't know. His whole justification here just seems a bit weak. I don't have answers. Also weak is his ability to lie convincingly when they spot the sign off the original Scarebo, and he tries to convince Justin his brother is still alive. Mary Beth decides to walk away from that awkward situation and happens to bump into the awkward situation. So, what you need to do is turn that frown upside down. Oh, thanks, Vernon. Make out with me. That Blair Witch, man. I tapped that, but she probably got cobwebs sealing it up. Voodoo. You know, Vernon kind of has that same problem as Ben, where he tends to put his foot in his mouth whenever he opens it, but at least Ben kind of knew how awkward he was. Vernon seems to think he's the coolest kid in class. We're the coolest kids at the school! No, we're not. I know. Your eyes open. Open. As they land the boats and push further into the swamp on foot, we get some character moments, like Avery and Leighton rekindling the relationship, and Vernon, Chad, and John trading some pointless ghost chatter. That out of the way, they all split up to cover more ground. This is a move borrowed straight out of movies like Friday the 13th, especially as the body counts had to rise in the sequels. See, to keep the teens from running off or bending together, they all get isolated into little bite-sized groups so that Jason can kill them quickly enough that they can't get the word out. So in contrast to last movie's hapless victims, this round of victims are all heavily armed, expecting him, and have working boats to escape on, so the movie splits them up into pairs that will be bouncing between as Crowley nimbly flips around the forest burning through the fake blood budget. Boom! Vernon! Read the room! While Chad and Cletus try to hunt some gators, Crowley appears and kicks off his main kill streak at 53 minutes and 10 seconds into the movie. Jamie's back, back, back. Tell a friend, friend. He's got 28 minutes and 11 seconds between now and the end credits to kill off Chad, Cletus, Justin, Reverend Zombie, John, Vernon, Leighton, Avery, Trent, and Uncle Bob. Can he make a new personal best? He comes out of the gate tackling Chad and beating him to death with a blunt end of his axe. Stop, Victor, no, he's already dead. Crowley, Crowley, Crowley. I don't think you're connecting with half of these. You're on the clock here, move along. Over in the main tour group, Justin finally wises up and confronts Zombie, who reveals his real plan. You know, I thought some of his logic was pretty contradictory, so yeah, this works better. But yeah, he thinks that if Crowley can get revenge on the kids that got him killed, he'll be able to rest in peace. So with Samson already dead, he just needs to get Crowley in front of the other two kids, who are conveniently Trent and Uncle Bob. Oh, you cheap bastard! You had no intention of paying Trent that money! Plot sufficiently advanced, we return to the killing. The ludicrous overkill of Chad's death gave Cletus plenty of time to escape, but Crowley teleports over to him and pulls him out of the boat and then shoves his face into the propeller. I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard for me to take anything that immediately follows a Wilhelm scream too seriously. And now violent death achieved, we visit Avery and Leighton for a minor character beat. Which is to say that, in the face of boobs, Leighton's engagement to not Avery will have to wait. Fuck it. If you don't mind, I'd really like to just find my brother and get the fuck out of here! After checking in with the main plot, we go back to Avery and Leighton, getting it on just like old times. You like this better than Jesus. <sighs> I think I get why Leighton left. Crowley finally puts a stop to the awkward dirty talk by beheading Leighton and his headless corpse races to the finish line which is actually a bit funny, but goes on a bit too long, I think. He lands a low blow on Avery and finishes her off in an incredibly unsexy blood-covered tit shot and a hatchet classic. Blood spattering on trees. The musical. Anyway, that pair taken care of, we pop back to the main group before the movie remembers that John and Vernon were also characters. Crowley takes so long starting up a chainsaw that the movie actually gets bored and returns to Mary Beth and Justin for another character beat mid-kill. And the truth? You knew my brother was dead! He eventually gets it started, and I actually think it's really funny how large this chainsaw is. Like, Victor's trying to compensate for something, but can't afford a Hummer. They fire a few shots at him, but he's completely unfazed and then chainsaws them in half from asshole to eyebrows. Oh Jesus, are those dangling testicles? That's three kills in a row where Crowley went straight for the naughty bits. Who hurt?
hurt you, Adam. Who hurt you? And now, with all the satellite groups thoroughly eviscerated, Crowley and the movie can focus on the main group. And I want to call out this exchange between Mary Beth and Justin. Give me your gun. No. I have nothing to say about it. I just think it's funny. Justin accidentally lets Zombie's actual plan slip, so Mary Beth realizes that Uncle Bob's been set up and runs off to warn him. Not wanting to get caught in the crossfire, Justin barricades himself in a back room of the cabin and tries to wait out the impending murder storm hiding in a closet. But that's exactly what a genius tactician like Victor Crowley would expect, so he's already in the closet with Justin. Following the now familiar beats, Justin takes a hit from Crowley, and then we cut to Mary Beth, who has met up with Uncle Bob and tells him about Zombie's trap. Then quickly, back to the murder at hand. Victor calls out one of the greatest hits from last movie, the gas-powered belt sander. And while I still haven't found anyone selling one of these, I did find a company selling gas-powered grinding wheels for railroad maintenance. So yeah, it's totally plausible. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for doubting these. Mr. Crowley. He does Justin in by trying out a new sort of lobotomy going in through the back of the skull, through the entire brain, and then quickly moves on to the next kill. And I understand why he's excited to get going, because on the chopping block now is Trent. This is a fight between horror's ultimate brawlers. This is Leatherface versus Jason. And it is an amazingly violent beatdown with no stunt people, since Kane and R.A. are stunt people. So they just throw each other around the set of full force. Zombie wants to make sure that he and Mary Beth don't get in the way while Victor finishes off Trent and Uncle Bob, so he drags her away, leaving Bob injured and stuck in the cabin. Crowley finishes Trent with this really cool curb stomp style move. Oh yeah. Oh, that's the good stuff. Adam Green is bringing his A-game to the finale. Uncle Bob eats it off screen, but gets nicely excessive blood spray across the windows. And the zombie declares that Victor Crowley can now rest in peace. That wasn't my real uncle. But what a twist! This guy was not the real Slim Shady, just a family friend that Mary Beth adopted after her real uncle died of leukemia. Crowley can't stop, won't stop killing, so all aboard the murder train, choo choo! Here's Vicky! Zombie tries to shoot, then strangle Crowley, but as a counterproposal, Victor chops him in half, pulls his torso out of his skin, and then tosses the flayed half-corpse into the trees. That shit's gotta sting. Very creative, but it's cost Crowley some time and disarmed him, which Mary Beth takes advantage of to steal his hatchet and attack the weak point for massive damage. A double tap, you go, girlfriend. Oddly, Hatchet 2 seems to me like it's both a standalone feature and the middle child of a trilogy. It includes enough of Victor Crowley's original backstory that you don't really need to have seen the first movie, but it also spends so much time building additional mythology that it could come off as a continuation of the first movie, setting up elements for a finale. Though if you are familiar with the original Hatchet, they reward that because a lot of the new mythology comes off as twists of what we heard during our first trip to the swamp, which keeps things interesting. But unfortunately, by spending so much time on backstory and building mythology, the characterization suffers, and the increased body count just makes that problem worse. That's not to say that the original had Oscar-worthy character studies, but at least they all had established, defining character traits and enough personality that you could root for them. The hunters here are just cannon fodder. Hell, I don't think Rick McCallum even had lines. Beyond that, the kills seem more exploitative and or phoned in, the really fun ones only being saved for the end. In Hatchet, the overkill was from how elaborate and fanciful all the kills were, but Chad's kill was so dirt symbol that it felt like a serious take on the idea that Crowley is a rage-filled murder machine uncontrollably lashing out. There's grounds for that interpretation because for all this supernatural cursing, Victor Crowley was a hulking powerhouse of a man with the mind of a child who died scared and confused. His ghost returning to the swamp every night, wailing for his father emotionally stuck in the middle of his untimely demise. It's... it's almost tragic, 
but taking Crowley seriously is out of place in the same movie as Biscuits and Chicken and Gravy, the musical. Biscuits and chicken and gravy. And then three kills in a row going straight for the crotch, plus turning Leighton's death into a sex joke and showing off Avery's boobs during her kill just seemed needlessly sexual for Crowley and more in line with a juvenile version of Rob Zombie than the tone of the first hatchet. But Green does bring it back after that with some very strong and interesting kills going into the finale. In all that said, this isn't a bad movie at all. Story and effects are where it really excels. The twists in the backstory play very well with established material, and the experiments with the more supernatural voodoo horror that I thought may have been missing from the first movie really pay off the extended flashbacks here and give the film some nice variety. And even if a few kills weren't great or rubbed me the wrong way, the makeup looks awesome and taken as a whole, the movie's gore is very fitting for the sort of one-upsmanship that a sequel should engage in. Its biggest problem really is just not being quite as fun as the first movie. Anyway, thank you again for checking out some modern horror. I hope you enjoyed watching, and if you'd like to be notified of future videos, please make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, comments are always appreciated. Cheers!